Happy 2022 and welcome everyone. My name is Dave Miller, Little League Western Region Instructor and Umpire in Chief for California District 31. Welcome to our five part training series on the Little League Rulebook. These sessions are designed for all parties, including Little League presidents, board of directors, managers, coaches, scorekeepers, and most importantly, our adult and youth umpires. Feel free to share these sessions in groups or with individuals directly. I'm pleased to have with us Gary Grotman, who is a Little League Western Region Rules Trainer and fellow California District 31 staff umpire. Gary will take us through the rule book in these sessions and know that if you have any questions on the material, feel free to reach out to your local league UIC or even Gary and I at any time throughout the season. Lastly, but certainly not least, please know that Little League does not happen without our amazing volunteers like you. You're a significant part of the hundreds of thousands of Little League volunteers worldwide, and whether you know it or not, you're making a huge difference in your communities. So on behalf of Little League's Western Region, thank you and enjoy the videos. All right, session four, talking about the batter and the runner. Gary, take it away. Good day, Western Region volunteers. Welcome back to talk session four which is probably one of the longer sections having to do with rule six on the batter and rule seven on the runner. Pretty much everybody thinks they understand exactly when a batter is going to be out. Fly ball legally caught, third strike legally caught, third strike not caught with the first base occupied before two are out. If the batter bunts foul with two strikes. Remember, it's a local option that the majors may use the option that a batter is out on the third strike, whether it's caught or not, during the regular season. The batter is also out when an infield fly is declared. When the batter is touched by a third strike, touched by a ball before touching or passing a fielder as, as, a, run, as a batter runner, if the bat hits the ball twice while fair, remember it's the bat hitting the ball, not the ball hitting the bat. Any foul ball which is intentionally deflected as a batter runner proceeds to first, after batting a ball, if first base is tagged before the batter runner reaches first base or the batter runner commits a running lane violation. If you have a line drive or a fly ball, which is intentionally dropped in the infield, you won't see this very often, but it's once again, one of those situations where we're trying to avoid the unwarranted double play. If a preceding runner intentionally interferes with a thrown or batted ball, or in the upper divisions, when a runner is stealing home with two outs and two strikes, and that runner is hit by a pitch in the strike zone. Talk about a comedy of errors that's going to be, but basically it's an upper division situation that you might catch once in your career. If we go back to L for a second, if a line driver of fly ball is allowed to drop intentionally but untouched this rule does not apply you can simply let it drop and then make the play because the infield fly situation is not in effect but if you glove it and then drop it this rule does apply family of illegally batted balls if the batter strikes the ball with a foot entirely on the ground entirely outside the batter's box then that's going to be an illegally batted ball, regardless of whether the ball goes fair or foul. If the batter has feet that are big enough, stepping on home plate while part of the foot is still on the line or even in the batter's box is not an illegally batted ball. This is what your umpire will see on an illegally batted ball. You don't get a whole lot of a view of the batter's feet as you're tracking the pitch in. So when does a plate umpire make the call on an illegally batted ball? It'll almost always be when the batter squares to the bunt and comes around in front of the catcher and you can quickly catch a view that that foot is completely out of the box. Doesn't have to be on the plate, but as long as it's completely out of the box when contact is made. The ball's dead, whether fair or foul, and the runners return to their time of pitch base. 
Illegal action by the batter is also if the pitcher is ready to deliver a pitch and the batter crosses home plate to get into the other batter's box. Anytime other than when the pitcher is ready to pitch, the batter may change from one batter's box to the other and does not need to have time called. As long as the pitcher is not ready to pitch, that movement is legal. Anytime you interfere with the catcher's fielding or throwing by stepping out of the box or making any other action that hinders the catcher's play at home plate, that is going to be illegal action. The batter's backswing on a third strike that knocks the ball out of the catcher's mitt or hinders the catcher's play is not interference, but it is a third strike on the batter in that case. <clears throat> If the swing carries the batter in front of home plate, interfering with the catcher's play, then that is also going to be illegal action, whether the runner is stealing or trying to return to a base. Contact does not have to occur, but a throw must be attempted. Attempted does not have to be made if for some reason the catcher is interfered with in such a way that he pulls up, stops, on the, stops his throw. And lastly, the use of an illegal bat. Anytime the batter enters the box with one foot on the ground with an illegal bat or is discovered having used the illegal bat prior to the next player entering the batter's box, when properly appealed by the manager, the batter will be out and the offensive team will lose the position of a base coach, of an adult base coach, for the remainder of the game. If the defensive manager chooses to accept the play, for example, they got an out when an, illegal, when an illegal bat was used, it may decline the out to the batter. They cannot decline the loss of the base coach for the remainder of the game. <clears throat> if unfortunately we have a second violation, the manager at that point subjected and we just go on from there. Remember, if the batter is carrying the illegal bat and has a step in the box and it's discovered, you simply remove the illegal bat without penalty. The illegal bat is used, the batter gets on first base, the appeal window closes, which is the next batter entering the box, then you simply remove the illegal bat and there is no other penalty. So you've got to catch it within the window and this can be done by either the manager a player like the catcher, or the umpire who sees it. Batting out of turn. Three key words here. The proper batter, the improper batter, and a batter who has become legalized because there was no appeal made. This is the same rule as whether you're using the bat nine rule 303 or you're using the continuous batting order under rule 404. In essence, if you have an improper batter who completes a time at bat and it's properly appealed, the proper batter is called out. If you're in the middle of the at bat with that illegal improper batter up, the proper batter may take a position in the batter's box and assume the current count at any time before the improper batter becomes a runner or is put out. Note, for purposes of mandatory play, because the proper batter stepped in with the partial count, this will not count as the time at bat for mandatory play. On the illegal appeal, the umpire shall take one of two actions. If you have a batted ball situation, such as an advance or score or an out caused by the improper batter's hitting of the ball, direct action, then that action is nullified. The advance to first base on a hit, an error, based on balls or hit by pitch, is removed and the proper batter is called out. Also, if you have a runner who steals, there's a balk or a wild pitch or a pass ball that basically is the improper batter's indirect action. The improper batter was simply standing there. Those are allowed to stand. When the improper batter becomes a runner and an appeal is not made, the improper batter becomes legalized. The results of that previous at-bat will stand. 
So I had an improper batter, not properly appealed, that improper batter standing on first base. So who is the next batter supposed to be? If an improper batter, you look at D2 here, if an improper batter becomes legalized, the next proper batter shall be the one who follows the just legalized batter. So if we batted one, two, three, and number three comes up when number one is supposed to come up, number three gets a hit and is on first base and is not appealed, who is the next batter? Because three was legalized, number four is the next proper batter. What about one and two? Do they get at bats at all? Nope, they have lost that because the appeal was not properly made and they will come to bat next time around. As a plate umpire, I always talk to my scorekeeper and announcer, especially during tournament play, to make sure that they know what their duties are prior to the start of the game. No one should ever call attention to either team that a player is batting out of turn. It's an appeal play. This sometimes becomes problematic when the manager's wife or somebody like that who's directly related to one team or the other notes the batting out of turn and signifies in some way, shape, or form what's going on. If that happens, it's unfortunate, but there is no protest if the scorekeeper or announcer act improperly. Announcers should make sure they look at the batter who is coming up and announce the player who is actually physically entering the batter's box, not the player who is due up at bat. Some people will overly complicate fixing a batting out of turn. It's very straightforward. You look at the batter who's being appealed, and is that batter being properly appealed within the window allowed before the next pitcher play? You then go back one batter. Is that batter proper, either proper or legalized? And then you ask, was the batter in question proper or improper? So if proper, there's no penalty. Previous play stands, look at the lineup card for the next proper batter. If not, call the proper batter out, reset the last play, and the next batter is the one who follows the proper batter just called out. Take a deep breath before you attack any of these. Sometimes you can end up with 27 different permutations and combinations, but I guarantee you, look at the batter being appealed, back up one, figure out what that is, and then proceed and you'll be fine. We move next to the runner. If two runners simultaneously occupy the same base, the trail runner will be out if both runners are on the same base and the trail runner is tagged while they're both on the base. This is not an automatic out. And if we end up in a rundown, if the lead runner is tagged out, and the trail runner is on the base last properly achieved by that lead runner, the trail runner must return to the trail base by umpire's direction. I'm not gonna talk through these real quickly, but these are, this slide and the next slide is a summary from rule six and rule seven of the four, three, two, and one base award for various situations. So on the home run or the ball deflected over the fence, that's a four base award. If a batted ball is hit, not if you throw your glove at it, but if you hit it with your thrown glove, that's a three base award. If a thrown ball hits a, is hit by thrown equipment, the thrown ball is gonna be the two base award. Any ball that sticks in shrubbery or goes into a dead ball area is gonna be a two base award. If you have a ground ball in the infield, that is thrown into dead ball territory, if it is the first play on that batter runner, then you place, you base the award of two bases on the time of pitch. The exception is if you have the batter runner and all runners have advanced to their next base, then you award from the time of throw. That exception will come up when a shortstop bobbles a ball or something else like that and then throws it away. Remember, if you have a double play, 
and the relay from second to first is thrown out of play, that is not the first play on the infield. So it would be a two-base award from time of throw in that case. One-base awards can have a little bit of difference between the runner and the batter. So catcher's interference, we end up in that situation. The pitcher box, the runner advances one base. If the catcher interferes with the batter in the upper divisions while the runner is stealing, that runner gets a one-base award. Hit by pitch, ball four, intentional walk, catcher's interference are all examples for the batter getting one base. And both the runner and the batter get one base. If a runner or batter is hit by a batted ball prior to passing an infielder, or if a pitch ball is played with attached equipment, or if a pitch ball is thrown by the pitcher from the pitcher's plate into a dead ball area. If the fielder makes a catch and carries a live ball into a dead ball area, that'll be a one base award for the runners. Over and over and over again, we'll see there is no must slide rule. If a fielder has possession of the ball and is waiting to make a tag, the runner must slide, attempt to get around, go back to last base occupied, or give up and be tagged. This is an example about as good as you can get of a runner attempting to avoid. You'll see that his arm goes around, circles in, he comes through, and then tags a plate. Rather than destroying the catcher, that runner made a very good effort to attempt to avoid. Also, if a runner slides head first advancing in majors and below, it's going to be an out. The rule does not apply when the runner's returning, only when advancing. The ball is live and other players may advance. And this is one of the reasons why we don't let the younger kids slide head first. Dangerous, and sometimes they end up in a kind of a strange position. A lot of discussion about what a head first slide is. It's prohibited in the majors and below level of play. What does a head first slide look like? Intentionally launches or leaps forward while advancing. Primary landing point is on the chest or stomach with the arms leading. These are not head first slides. Sliding feet first away from the base and reaching out with a hand to touch the base. You'll see a lot of professional players doing this. You'll see a lot of little leaguers picking it up. That is not a head first slide as they go forward. Stumbling, tripping, poorly executed or clumsy feet first efforts are not head first slides. And once a player ends up in a collision or for some other reason is stopped short of a base and then they lunge forward with their hands outstretched after stopping is not an example of a head first slide. Let's take a look here in a softball game. What do we got here at the plate? Ground ball to third, runner from third coming in. As we see in slow motion, this is another one of our examples of a poorly executed stumble kind of thing, not intended to be a head first slide. You see that she stumbled, fell. Once again, we talk about baseline base path. You end up in this situation with three feet or more out of the baseline as a violation. The tag must be initiated for the play to be ruled a runner being out of the baseline. What do we got here? Go, go, go. You see that no tag is initiated. Therefore, the young man is okay. I'm gonna run that one again real quick just because I like the way little kids play. Fueler comes in, tries to pick up the ball, no attempt at a tag, and he makes it to first. 
that would not be a violation. One of the more important things that umpires and managers need to work together on is properly assessing an appeal play. There are four base running appeals. After a fly ball is caught, the failure to retouch the runner's base after the ball is caught, missing a base while advancing or returning, failure to return to first base immediately after overrunning first base, or failure to touch home plate. We'll notice that on the first one, the retouching of a base after a fly ball is properly caught. If the ball is juggled, if the ball bounces into the air or whatnot, the runner may properly retouch the first contact with the defensive player's glove. And failure to return to first base immediately after overrunning, the batter runner is protected, but should return directly to the base if there is any action which is intervening and the first baseman or anybody with the ball tags or appeals the runner's failure to touch first base, that would be a proper appeal. Batter appeals, use of an illegal bat or batting out of turn. Guidelines for the appeals. If you have a runner appeal, it absolutely must be with a live ball. The appeal window is before the next pitch player attempted play must be made before the defense leaves fair territory. On the batter appeals, time must be called. You've got to have a dead ball situation because the manager is the one making the appeal and he can't come on the field with the ball still alive and in play. So on the illegal bat, it's before the next batter steps into the box. And on a situation of, <clears throat> excuse me, of batting out of turn, before the next play, pitch player attempted play, and before the defense leaves fair territory. The first part of this is not very valuable, but it's the second half that is. Ball go. Home run. Calus here hits a home run to right center field. You two goes Tristan out. Tristan and Cal Lucia go back to back. You three comes back from coming across. And the plate umpire is still at home. Uh, right. Where are you at? So listen, take your warm ups, get loose. As soon as we start the play, appeal it. All right, just just throw over, step off the rubber, throw over to first, by right, the third, and we'll get that out. Hey. Okay, so we finish his warm up Gorman, pitches. Who started the game at third base will now. Okay, the team in red is down 10 to nothing right now in the third inning. Time has not been rescinded, so the ball's not in play yet. Throw over there. Ball's still dead, young men. Try again. Calls play. Steps off. Throw to third. Plate umpire makes the call for missing the base. Notice that it was before the next play or attempted play. No live pitch was thrown, so it was a valid appeal. Every runner must touch all bases legally in order. One run scores each time a circuit is made. If a runner fails to legally touch a base while advancing or returning, this is subject to appeal. Something that we need to be aware of. During a dead ball situation, if a runner is awarded a base, the runner must touch each base in order, even though the ball is dead. Different than that, when returning to a base after a foul ball, the runner may proceed directly to the proper base without retouching the bases that he or she may have touched during the foul ball play. This example shows a play at first while the, while the runner trips over the first baseman's foot. The first baseman has the ball, minor collision with the feet happen, and the runner 
goes to is at first base. Now let's stop for a second here. If we have a situation here where instead of being caught by the fielder, this throw went in to the dead ball area. So the runner has missed first base, the umpire properly calls time and awards the batter runner second base. This runner must come back and retouch first base before proceeding to second, even though the ball is dead. Now, this sometimes becomes complicated because the runner will be eight or 10 feet past first base over running. The umpire points to second and the runner simply goes to second. So just be alert to that, that they've got to touch the bases even on a dead, even on a dead ball award. Rule 713, base runners shall not leave their bases until the ball has reached the batter. When the runners have stopped advancing, pitchers in contact with the pitcher's plate, catcher's ready to receive. As we've had drilled into us from day one as umpires, a violation by one base runner affects every base runner. So we got three basic situations. Batter does not hit the ball and a runner leaves early. Delayed dead ball. If an out occurs, the out stands. If no outs, all runners return to time of pitch base. The batter does hit the ball. If a play is made once again, any out stands. If no outs are made, the runners return to the time of pitch base that is closest to the time of pitch base. The errors will determine the value of the hit. So, for example, we have a runner on first. Batter hits the ball into the gap and gets a clean double. But the runner on first left early. Base umpire dropped the red flag to indicate the runner had left early. Where do I put that runner from first base? Because it's a clean double determined by the UIC, the batter runner stays on second and the closest base to time of pitch was third base. So that's where R1 now is on third base. Now, the one that uh, gets most attention is the bases loaded situation that if a ball is put in play and remains in the infield or is a bunt or is a third strike not caught and all runners advance one base, then the runner on third is placed in the dugout with no penalty and you simply mark in the scorebook 713C. That's on a batted ball not leaving the infield or a third strike not caught. If, however, the bases are loaded, one runner leaves early, and we have a walk or hit by pitch. The batter runner goes to first, all runners advance one base, and one run does score on this play. If ball four is wild or thrown out of play, the runners will still advance only one base. Special pinch runner. In order to encourage participation, Little League has set up a rule that a player who's not in the current batting order may be used as a special pinch runner for any offensive player. There is a local option that allows this instead of every inning to be reduced to twice per game. A player who is on the bases may be removed only once per game for a special pinch runner, and a special pinch runner is not allowed if you're using continuous batting order because everybody is in the game. Courtesy runners. Once again, a local option designed to speed the game up. A runner may be entered for the pitcher or catcher of record when two are out. The pitcher or catcher not removed from the game. The runner must report to the plate umpire so the plate umpire understands whether it's a special pinch runner, a courtesy runner, or a substitution. The same runner may not be used for both position of pitcher or catcher in the same game. If you're using continuous batting order, the runner is the last out of that given inning. I didn't go through 715 double first base again because we covered that earlier and so few leagues in baseball use it. David, back to you. Gary, great information today. And thank you uh, for uh, your input. Uh, thank you to all the viewers for attending uh, session here number four. And we look forward to uh, the next one, number five. Take care, guys.